Hi, um, that's a Rube Goldberg machine and I am a professional Rube Goldberg machine maker. I've been making machines since I was five years old, I think. And that was my first machine, it's called the lolly machine, and, or the candy machine, and it's for storing my candy. So obviously very useful for a five-year-old, but also I noticed it made my parents uh, smile and laugh. And that is what encouraged me to keep making machines. So I made a machine to turn the light off from bed. I made a machine so when my mum came home from work late at night, she would open the door and it would pull a string that would press play on a tape player that said, welcome home, mum, I love you, or something. <laughs> and then I stopped as a teenager, got interested in other things, and when I was 22, I rediscovered my passion, and it was through YouTube. I was watching these Japanese Rube Goldberg machines and my roommates and I got very inspired. We're, we're gonna make our own. And we started building in the living room. And uh, uh, they lost interest in an hour, but seven months later I was still going. And I had a machine that went around the whole um, apartment. And it was to make a cup of tea for my friends when they visited. But it took so long to run that the tea would be cold, so I didn't use it for that. I, instead, I filmed it. And I put it on YouTube, but something unexpected happen, happened. That got millions of views. And that was the beginning of, a change of, of my change of careers. And uh, I started getting job offers, and now I, do, I make these machines for all sorts of things. Um, I also do things for brands or commercials and I do uh, uh, illustrations for kids' books, all sorts of things. So you might notice that the, the machines are usually made out of everyday objects, used in unexpected ways. For example, this bottle of water, it's not just a bottle of water. It'll also roll. It'll fall off a table. You could use it as a weight if you tie a string to it, and you could make it heavier or lighter by adjusting the water in the bottle. As kids, when you're first discovering the world, everything is delightful and surprising, and, and, and the world is full of wonders, right? As we get older, we sort of get used to the way things work. So I guess I'm hoping that with my machines, by using familiar objects in unfamiliar ways, I want to remind people of how delightful the world can be and, and really how lucky we are to live in this particular physical reality with all its quirks and peculiarities. Also, using objects in unexpected ways is a really fabulous tool for teaching innovation, for kids especially. Because it, it epitomizes innovation in a way, because you're taking something and using it in a different way, that it's not intended, that it wasn't originally intended to be used. So for example, uh, a car doesn't have to, if you're an innovative person, you see it and you can see it doesn't have to work the way it does. It doesn't have to run on petrol and cause fumes. Maybe there's a cleaner way of doing it. And, if you can start teaching that at a young age, obviously we're going to have uh, better innovation uh, as kids get older. So machines are usually designed to achieve a task as efficiently as possible, whereas a Rube Goldberg machine, it's as inefficient as possible. It's the opposite. It introduces play and whimsy in a world where they usually don't belong. And in this way, I think it shows it's more about the journey than the destination, right? That, uh, that old, I'm sure there's, there's a similar uh, idiom in, in German, in Austrian German. Um, in this way, it, it's also more about the experience than the end goal. So, as adults, we tend to focus on end goals. We're very risk averse. If we have a problem that we need to solve, 
We want to solve it in the safest way possible. We're all afraid of failure. So we do things that we know we've seen work before and that we think will work in this situation, rather than taking risks. Kids are different. They're more willing to entertain unlikely hypotheses. Uh, the, sometimes their solutions to things are very silly and, and would never really work, but every now and then they come up with something that an adult would not have thought of that is actually better. Uh, they, th that kind of thinking can lead to creative and genius solutions, and I think it's very important to nurture that from a young age so that as an adult, you're still able to tap into that ability. Okay, so this is one way of thinking about the creative process. I like to divide it into two general sort of sections. The first is the divergent phase, which is like an expanding phase, where you have to think of as many ideas as possible to try and solve your problem. Brainstorming, we say in English. I don't know if there's a similar German term. Um, and usually this involves coming up with some very bad ideas, but one, hopefully, at least one good idea. And this is what people, I think, typically associate with the word creativity, like thinking of all these crazy, inspiring ideas, right? Then there's another very important part, which is once you've picked the idea you like, you have to make it happen. You have to execute it. And you have to solve a lot of problems. And this is maybe more r logical thinking or rational thinking, but it's equally important to, that, to, that, to the process. And then that should say repeat, not repeaty. I don't know why it says that. <laughs> But um, then that whole process can repeat within the process. So for example, let's say you're, you're invited to a fancy dress party, and the theme is under the sea. Uh, so you, you have to come up with something to wear. So first you have the divergent phase, and you think of all different ideas. Like maybe I could go as a mermaid. Oh, no, nah, that's kind of boring. I'm sure other people will do that. A crab, uh, too difficult. Uh, a jellyfish, oh, actually I have that, those blue plastic bags that I never use. Maybe that would be a great, uh, like the garbage bag could be a, a jellyfish outfit. I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna pick that one. Then you have the, 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 the convergent phase where you're like, okay, how am I gonna put this bag on me? How am I gonna wear it? Uh, how am I going to make it more jellyfish shaped? How am I going to make sure I'm not cold during, what am I going to wear underneath? All these logical things that you need to make the, the project happen. And then within that, that process might repeat. So now you've figured that out. Now you want a, a jellyfish face. What are you going to do for that? Makeup? Uh, should I put another bag over my face? Uh, you know, you start brainstorming ideas again, again for that and repeat the process within the process. Um, okay, so, so that, that playtime that I gave myself, I like to think of that as super divergent time, because it's time where I'm thinking of new ideas and I don't even have a goal, I don't even have a reason. Uh, super, di super divergent time. And it, it's generating ideas that don't solve a problem. It's also, you can also call it play. So I do a lot of workshops with kids where we make these machines. And the best, the best trick I've learned is to build into that workshop near the beginning some playtime, where I'll give them objects and I, we, they don't have a goal yet. And I just say, I want you to learn your object, play with it, see if you can discover some cool things that it does, even though there's no purpose to that. And I think that that kind of playtime is perhaps something you can use in other educational contexts. Uh, a time where it doesn't matter what the, what the ultimate learning objective is almost. I don't know. Uh, in America, George Bush instituted a policy called No Child Left Behind. Do, are any of you familiar with that in the education space? I don't know. Um, and this is, I guess, 10, 15 years ago. And it's, it's well known as a policy that failed. And it involved a lot of testing of students from an early age. Um, all, every year, and checking that they were up to the standards. Testing obviously is important, 
But in a way, it's the opposite of playtime, because you have a very dis definite goal, and it doesn't leave a lot of room for out-of-the-box thinking. You have a fixed path that, you, that they have to go along, and it doesn't give, give uh, kids a chance for, for chasing rainbows. And I think that that is the reason that, well, that, that program is, there's now a, a lack of, uh, there's a problem in America with students graduating with good creative skills and STEM skills, STEM being science, technology, education, and math. And in my opinion, it's, because, it's largely because of too much testing that that generation has gone through. Even though you'd think for, for technology and science, testing would be really important. But actually, science is all about observation. And learning to observe without a goal can be one of the, the most valuable tools. For, for example, me observing the ketchup coming off the bottle without even having a goal. And companies use this. So 3M is famous for giving their employees 15% of their time to themselves to just work on their own projects. And the, the, the 3M post-it notes uh, were actually invented in that downtime by um, an employee who was experimenting with a new kind of glue that wasn't very sticky. And he actually thought maybe there's a way this could be useful for something else.